All right, so let's talk about gear and what just a basic introduction to um, pedals and guitar gear and things like that, building a pedal board and, and all of these different things. I'm going to shift over here to my electric. This is my Telecaster that I do so much work on. And uh, I've, we've got our pedal cam over here that we are doing. And let me just kind of, as, as you're looking at the pedal board, let me just kind of show you what I have here. This is my standard pedal board that I use for lots of different things. So over here, I'll give you a quick introduction, then we'll go through each piece of it. Here I have my uh, volume pedal. Here is a compressor. This is the first thing that my signal hits when I play. It goes from right from my cable. Actually, right now it's going into a wah pedal because I wanted to show that to you here in a second. It goes into the compressor. After the compressor, it goes into, um, let's see, the distortion, this Jekyll and Hyde distortion, which has two sides of it that we'll talk about. Then it goes into this second distortion here. Each of these has two sides. So I basically have four different uh, types of, of sounds I can get through this. Out of this, it goes into my volume pedal, which I like having the ability to be able to fully uh, have a fully distorted sound that I can control. Uh, from there, I think it goes into this dynamic filter. After that, it goes into the delay, the, uh, the reverb here with the dispatch master. After that, I go into the diddle looper. After the diddle looper, uh, it goes into the, Mark, the MK423 by Creation Audio Labs, which is just a clean boost. And then it goes out to my amp. So there, there is kind of the basic flow of my signal chain. But let's talk about pedals here just for a second. Pedals, their gear is not everything to a, to a guitarist. Let me let me just say that and make that abundantly clear. Gear is important, but gear is not everything. Ninety percent of your tone is going to come from your fingers. Ninety percent of your ability and what comes through down onto the a recording is going to be your skill, your 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 fingers. Okay, so some guys get really bent out of shape with pedals and gear. Let me just do a disclaimer right up front. Gear is important, but gear is not everything, okay? Gear is not even most of things. So like there's a, a bazillion different pieces of gear that other guys have and that other guys use. This is just the colors that I have in my, in my paint kit, okay, that I use. Um, so we'll talk about that, but gear is important. Here's some, here's some things I would suggest when buying gear buying a new pedal or whatever. The great uh, studio guitarist Paul Jackson Jr. out in uh, Los Angeles who's done so much work with uh, Michael Jackson and, and uh, so many R&B artists over the years. Um, his thoughts on pedals are buy one pedal, figure out how to use just that one pedal, and then you buy another one. It's all a system. So once you, everything affects everything else. So if you buy like five pedals and you'll quickly get overwhelmed with all of the, the parameters that you have to adjust. Now, there are also, let me also say, there are also multi-effects units, and some of them are really good. Um, I, I, am, uh, I, I use standard pedals, but some guys use these multi-effects units. The studio I was in just the other day, they had a Line 6 um, um, smaller unit, had three buttons on it, I forget the name of it, Helix or something like that, and uh, he just raved about it, said it was a great thing. I trust the man. So it was a, um, um, you know, that's a great multi-effects unit. So I am using just regular single pedals, so that's what I can speak to for that. But generally pedals, you'll have a volume, sort of a knob. You'll have a, the level of the effect that you can use and then the other parameters that you deal with. Most of them are, can be controlled with a battery, powered with a battery, or a power supply. Now, there are links to all of my gear. If you're interested, we've had a lot of folks ask about my gear. If you're interested in, in that, I put links in the YouTube description. So all the links to all the gear that I use are there. And we've, we've, we've worked with uh, uh, Amazon where we can to, um, to provide links to those things. And, and uh, if you're interested in getting any of those, then, then um, we get a little commission from that or whatever. We've just worked out an arrangement with, with Amazon for that. So if you're interested, I'm not pushing anything. And a lot of the gear I use is not available. So not, not on Amazon. I had to you know cheat and find it on eBay or something. 
So, but if you're interested in any of these things, check the links below. It has the links to all the gear that I'm using. Okay, all right, so here we have um, various different categories of pedals. Now, they're basically modulation sort of pedals, which are controlling how the sound is being manipulated. Those would be your choruses and flangers and, and um, phasers, things like that. You have uh, other types of pedals, which are your distortion and gain sort of pedals. Those would be all your distortions, your, your um, overdrives, things like that, gain adjusting pedals. Then you have delays and reverbs, that big category of pedals. So, um, which take the sound, the sound that you've already produced, and, and add an echo to it, add a, add a delay to it, add a reverb to it, something to it. And then you have some other pedals that do just kind of specialty things. So, um, there, there are some ideas of things that you can do. Um, here, here, let me just kind of talk you through some um, pedals. The, the, uh, I know they can get very specific. Let me just kind of give you some general... Um, general things that you can um, think about when you're when you're building a pedal board. The, you kind of need one of each certain types of effects. If you're an electric player, you need some sort of a distortion pedal. Okay, my go-to rock bottom entry level distortion pedal. You can't get any better than an Ibanez TS9, the old slime green tube screamer. Okay, that is a great pedal for just great sounding distortion. It's not an expensive pedal, and it is a, um, you know, it's just a good, you can find them everywhere. It's been on the market forever, and this is, the, this is a great pedal uh, for if you're looking for just a good starting out distortion pedal, the Ibanez TS9 um, Tube Screamer, okay? Um, another pedal that I, has become of invaluable to me is a, is a volume pedal, okay? So they usually have some sort of a, kind of a gas pedal look about them, and all it does is when it's down like this, your guitar is off. When it's down like this, your guitar is fully on. Now, you wouldn't think that that would be such an important thing, but wow. Um, it is important to, if you need a little bit more gain to, when you're playing a solo, or you need to back off because you're playing a little bit more of aggressive part or something, uh, and you need it to be quieter, it's really helpful to have a, a, a volume pedal that, that goes down like that. Um, so anyway, there's some, there's some ideas on that. Let's first talk about the actual pedal board itself. So let's switch over here to the pedal board cam. The pedal board itself, this black unit here that this is all on, I use pedal train pedal boards. They're, they're inexpensive and uh, you know, they're, they're durable and they've got like a dozen different sizes and things like that. So depending on how many, how many, um, pedals you have, you, they can get you the right one. I love pedal train. They're made right here in Nashville and I know the guy that makes them and, um, uh, it's a great, great little company and I've used pedal train boards for years. They're aluminum. They're not wood. Um, you can get power supplies with them and not power supplies with them. Um, talking about power supplies. I've got, I use the True Tone One Spot. It's a little plug-in. Unfortunately, I don't have one that you can see because it's all powering my stuff. Um, but it's a little, you know, just a little wall wart sort of a thing um, that, that powers all of this. And it could power three or four more boards. And it's a little dot of a thing like that. And I have two or three of them just to power, uh, just in case I need a spare. So that is always a good, that's what I have used from, from uh, um, for the last decade, I've used the one spot. Now there are others that uh, that uh, Voodoo Lab puts out a good one, a power supply. The thing is, they take up a lot of space, just real estate on your board. So I like my little one spot. It does what I need to do, and and uh, I've had a few of them just wear out because I use them, you know, all the time, and uh, I just get another one. That's why I have a spare. I have a uh, spare. Um, uh, two or three of these so that I can always power up my boards. And so I have, I use pedal train boards for my electric board and my acoustic board. Uh, again, I put those links in the YouTube description there if you're interested in looking at seeing what exactly I'm using. All right, so let's go over to this. Um, the first thing my signal hits is this compressor. What a compressor does is a compressor takes your sound and uh, 
your sound is soft and it's loud, okay? So it can be, it, it has a wide dynamic range. And so what a compressor does is it just kind of squishes that dynamic range so that when I play soft, it's not quite so soft. And when I play loud, it's not going to jump out so much in the system. So a compressor is a great, great thing to have. My compressor that I'm using is the um, um, COP66 single pedal by True Tone. And uh, now they've got it in other forms, but this is, is in a little bit older mo uh, module. I have it on all the time. So here's my guitar without anything. Okay, so that's my guitar. Just let me even turn off the clean boost. Let me turn off the compressor. Okay. There's my guitar without anything. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to turn on my compressor, and I'm going to turn back on my clean boost so, that, so I can get my signal right, the right level. Now, so here's the compressor. It already kind of cleans up and punches up the sound a little bit, and that's exactly what a compressor is supposed to do. Now, I can, I can make it squish the sound a little bit more to where it, it'll, it'll work a little bit more for, you know, country chicken picking, that sort of stuff. But for me, where this is at, I, I can even marked on it in a permanent marker the settings that I like. So this is my guitar with it. My guitar without it. Do you see how my sound just kind of flattened? This squishes it and pushes it up. Okay? That's what a compressor does. A very key, I used to not think compressors were very important. Compressors are actually really important now. If my pedal board um, uh, suddenly was stolen, that would be one of the first things I would buy as a compressor these days to get that punch back in my sound. Okay, the next thing that is important to me is the volume, is the volume spell. Now, unfortunately, I don't have it where I, I can move it right there, but... Okay, so what I like about the visual volume, again, sorry, it's an older pedal, they don't even make them anymore, is it's got the lights. Why on earth do pedal manufacturers not include lights on a volume pedal? It is a no-brainer. I use those lights all the time. I generally have my sound at about midway here, about five up, and so that way I know I can get more if I need it. Do that. Without the lights, I'm kind of flying blind. So I don't know why they don't put lights on them. It's like a great, it's a great thing. So this is a visual volume with the, with the lights so I can tell exactly how far the volume is engaged. Let me also mention while I'm here, so this is a, this is a really key. If I want to tune, I just back it all the way off and I can tune. Like right now, I'm using the Polytune up here by TC Electronics, a very accurate tuner. So I'm tuning, going through my strings now, tuning. Now, it does have a different mode that I could, uh, where I could play all of them. And if I was out, like, let me take one of them out. See how that one suddenly went down? So even if I just do all six strings, it'll, uh, it'll show me which ones are out. But I like the individual one where I can go through it. And so that's on kind of all the time. All right, so that's, that's these. Now, the one thing you can't see down here is I plugged in just a wah for you to guys to, to hear what a wah sounds like. Um, let me get that sort of a sound. And then I've got my Johnny Highland wah down here. So this... There you go. So that's what a wah does. Okay. Um, you can have auto wahs that automatically do the, the cycle between the, the frequency sweep when it goes down there. Now, I saw that Thomas Russ had said, uh, uh, can you suggest another YouTube channel that explains all about pedals? Thomas, yes, please. Um, uh, suggest whatever you want to. I'm by no means saying that I am the, the grand expert on pedals. Uh, I have the colors that work for me. And so 
Um, uh, Mark is saying on the wah, um, this is the wah is not engaged. Can you hear when I, when I engage it? It kind of goes through this frequency sweep. Thomas is suggesting That Pedal Show, a great YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed to That Pedal Show, uh, check it out. That Pedal Show is the name of the YouTube channel. I know that one. And great, great. Um, so he's asking what is, a, what is a fully cocked wah, what is a fully one all the way down? It kind of gets this AM radio sound. which can be a really cool sound. Anyway, that's what a wah does. So that's the sound of a wah. Now, I also have over here on the, the, the pedal board a, a dynamic filter. This is kind of an auto wah. And what an auto wah does is it automatically, as soon as, depending on how loud I hit, the string, it, it goes through that frequency sweep. So when I just barely hit it, so it gets that, it gets that kind of a wah, 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 duck sound. And I can bring it down, the frequency range down. Okay, so it's a pretty cool little effect pedal. I don't use it very much, but when I need that effect, I've got it. Um, so let's go into the distortion realm of things. Um, Neil is saying, just starting out, what would be the best pedal to get first? Uh, I would suggest probably a distortion pedal would be a good pedal to get first. Uh, if you're doing any sort of thing that's pop or lead or something like that, that's a great pedal to, to start out with, is some sort of distortion pedal. Now, I use several different ones. I've got two here in the Jekyll and Hyde. This first one is kind of a Marshall sound. <laughs> So it's a great little sound, and I can control the gain and the volume of this one. All right, let me, let me introduce you to a big concept on these sort of gain effects. Gain and volume. Gain is, think of that as kind of the level of distortion. Now, there's actually much more science going to it, but the level of distortion you're adding to your signal. But here's what's really happening. So get this image in your mind when you relate get, uh, gain and volume. Okay, think of like the water coming into your house from the, the city, okay? You've got, you've got the city line comes in, it's, got, it's going to your whole neighborhood, but there's a little line that comes off to your house. Now there's a, there's a, 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 a way to control the amount of flow out there by the street, okay, you've got that. But then it comes into the house and you've got your, your final little your, uh, your faucet at your sink. So both of them control the level of what's going on. Now, this one out here by the street that's controlling the big flow of that, because you wouldn't want the full flow of the city water blasting into your house. Even if you just opened up your little faucet just a little bit, it would go, psh, it'd be too much, okay? That's gain, that's gain. What makes that great distortion sound is that pushing all of that sound, all of that water into the system and overdriving the system, okay? That's what gets that. So if I have that open, okay, then there's a lot of pressure in the system. Then I need to not have my volume very high because that's your one at your sink. If I have that one and the full blast coming from this, it's gonna be too much. So that's the relationship between, if I want a clean sound, I turn my gain not off, because I can't turn the flow off by the street, then I'm not going to get anything. So i got to get a little bit of it down over here, but then I open this one at the sink all the way, and that'll get me a cleaner sound. If I wanted a distortion sound, then I open up the gain over here, getting a real a lot of pressure coming through the system, and then I just barely open up the volume 
and I'll get a very distorted sound. Don't believe me? Let's try it. So here I've got gain, here I've got volume, okay? So I'm going to, right now I got it set like this. Let me turn the volume all the way down. So I'm got to crank the, grain, the gain all the way up. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of distortion happening in the system, but you can't hear any of it because I've got my final little faucet down. But as soon as I turn that up. A very distorted sound. Okay, very distorted sound. Now, if I don't want that much distortion, then I can back that gain off, crank my volume up a little bit. So I still have that gain in there. It's just a little bit more mixed with my normal signal. So that's the relationship with gain and, uh, and uh, volume on that. Now, some of you are asking about tube amps and overdriving the tubes. It's the same thing when you work into a, into a tube amp. This is basically just kind of faking that, that sort of electronic overdrive. Now, there are different types of distortions. This side is more of a distortion. This side is more of an overdrive. <laughs> Overdrives tend to be a little bit more uh, warm. Distortions tend to be a little bit more harsher. There's kind of like a scale, and down here on the harsh end of things is um, distortions, metal zones, things like that. Okay, then you get into distortions, then you should get warmer, you get into overdrives. It gets you a warmer sort of a distortion. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you want the edge of the, of the, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the overdriven signal to be more on the distortion end of things. So anyway, those are the two types of things. Now I can even combine them. So if I have both of these going. Listen to how much sustain I've got. It's still sustaining. Okay, so when I have them both, you, you gain some sustain. If I played with my compressor long enough, man, I could get a lot of sustain and, and it to even be more uh, lengthier of a sustain by, by tweaking the compressor a little bit. So I have these, which I use, and this is kind of my main lead one. Um, and then I have over here a dual overdrive. Now on this one, the VSXO, this is an overdrive, so it's a little more on the warmer side of things. But this one side, I have it pure clean. Here's my guitar normal. Here's this, which I use this as just kind of a, when I'm doing something softer and I want a little bit more of a boost. Without it. With it. This side gets a little warmer distortion yet. Okay, so you just barely a little bit of distortion in there. And look how I have it set. The drive is almost, you know, kind of almost off, and then I have just a little bit of volume to make up the difference there. So anyway, that's basically how distortions and overdrives work. When I do want to do a lead sound, I start playing with these and I start adding and combining those in different ways. Um, those are your distortion effects. Now, there are different types I've used over the years. Here's a great one. This is a little Expandora. Ooh, baby. This is a good, this is a good one there. I've also had a full drive. Those are great too. Klons. I've never owned a Klon, but uh, wow, if you get the chance to uh, uh, see one on eBay, which is pretty rare that you would even see one on eBay. Those are like 800 bucks now for a Klon. Um, now, again, don't get, don't, don't misunderstand me. Oh my goodness, Steve, you're telling me I need to go get the best one ever. No, I'm not. Don't go mortgage your house for a dumb pedal. Okay. This is just a color. This is just a paintbrush. The idea, the source of everything comes from your heart and your musicianship and stuff like that. This is just the paintbrush, okay? Now, different brushes will allow you to get different things, but uh, uh, don't, don't, there's a lot of guys that are chasing tone that are spending way, way too much on pedals. 
and because as it's not about that as much as it's about your hand. I've seen Jack Pearson come in with a tube screamer and go guitar, tube screamer, tube screamer, amp, and get brilliant distortion and all that sort of stuff and just sounds amazing, okay? So just just realize you can you can get way too excited about these. Um, it's just it's just colors. It's just 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 options. Um, okay, let's talk about um, modulation type effects. Okay, um, modulation effects are choruses, which I don't even have a chorus on my board at the moment. I used to use chorus all the time. Now I don't really use uh, choruses. I should have had one plugged in for this. Uh, demonstration. Oh, I guess I could. Let me, if you don't mind me looking down here for a second, let me, I'm going to plug this chorus in. This is a little TC electronic chorus. And, um, okay, let's see if I can get this working. Maybe not. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, you'll have to go to that pedal show and get a, and see what, how choruses and phasers and all of those things, flanges work. It's not actually as popular of a sound nowadays as it used to be. Um, choruses used to see them all the time. Now you just don't, uh, you just don't see them that much. Um, and so, Well, bum, this isn't working, but um, when I get it, uh, when I'll, I'll have to find another one and put it back on my board. So those are, of course, modulation type effects. Now, I would think pogs, which I wanted to get a pog as well. Uh, the pogs uh, add all these kind of other layers to your sounds where you play your guitar. They add all this other stuff to your sound, too. Those are really cool. You can go off the way off the deep end on those. Really cool. Um, usable? Eh, not that much. Not that much. Um, Mark Colder is asking, Steve, have I used a uh, Helix? I have not, but I've heard good things about them. I've heard good things about them. Um, let me talk you through a, la a last couple of ones of these, and then we, we will uh, answer some more questions and get out of here. Um, let's get to some delays. Okay? Delays. Okay, here I've got, this is just a regular... Um, single tap delay. I, do, I was using the double tap for a while. Uh, now I just ran out of space on my board, so I went back down to a uh, single tap. So all this does, it's a delay. Dot, 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 dot. And I can slow it down. Right, right now it's doing tap tempo, so I can tap the tempo in, which is really handy if I'm doing a song like this. Dot, 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 dot. And I do, let's say, an eighth note. Hear, hear that? Da, 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 da. That's let me crank it up a little bit. Let me crank it up even a little bit more. Let's add some distortion, huh? Let's have some fun. Okay, that tempo is that. Dut, 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 and right now it's going dut, 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 the repeats. I can change that to be where it's going three against two. Let me get back to it. There it is. So now it's going go, 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 go. hear all that rumbling in the background if I turn it off this is all I'm doing if I add the reverb or the delay ok 
kind of gets that U2 sort of a sound. Now I can control different uh, levels of how quick that reverb goes. So there it's very, very slow. If I speed it up, let's do this. Ah, here how it's now just a slap. Now that reverb, that delay is right on it. chicken picking stuff that's a delay okay over here I've got a uh, I've got wow this big old reverb do you hear all of that going on back behind me let me just crank it up to nuts got so much reverb. Now I can control that. I can bring that down. Now this one has a delay in it as well that you can add in. So it just adds a bunch of a bunch of stuff to it. A bunch of trails along. It's really good if you're doing softer things and you need a lot of color. Uh, that's a great little pedal um, to use. Um, you know who's got a great pedal video? Look at Tom Bukovec's rig rundown with Premier Guitar. Tom Bukovec, one of the great studio players here in Nashville, he does just about one of the best rigged rundowns I've seen. Um, and he talks all about these pedals, shows you how they work, and stuff like that. Check out Tom Bukovec's Rig Rundown in, uh, 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 from Premier Guitar. I'll try and put that link in the, in the description below uh, after, the, after we finish. The last thing, the secret sauce to my sound is the, um, um, the Creation Audio Labs MK423. That, if my pedal board was stolen, that would be probably one of the first pedals I would buy back again, would be that pedal. It is basically... Just a, just a, a volume knob for your guitar. So it can crank up insane, and that's all it does is it just gives it a little bit of a clean boost, a little bit of a tightening up of your sound. I love that pedal. Okay, so there you go. Uh, after that, it goes into the diddle looper, which I use sometimes when I'm doing uh, um, uh, illustrations. You guys have seen me use that. It'd be difficult for me to use it without the... Uh, 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 my With my feet, with using my hands, it'd be kind of difficult to do it. But that's a great little help, practice help for... for mm. um, um, doing, you know, practicing and things like that. I never use this when I'm performing. It's just too tricky to try and try and get. Now, some guys do. I just have never uh, got it uh, to that level. But this is kind of the main rig that I'm using when I'm recording. Now, I could, rep I could change out any of these pieces. Nothing is magical about these pieces. These are just things that worked 
that have worked for me. And some guys will swear up and down for other things, and that's completely cool. I have no, no problem with that at all. Now, another thing that's really cool these days is uh, the Kemper Profiler. The Kemper Profiler is this thing that's about the size of a, of a, of a bread box, a toaster, uh, maybe. And uh, it can get all sorts of amp modeling sounds, but they're just incredibly great. A lot of guys here in Nashville don't even bother with amps anymore. They just bring in a Kemper Profiler and run their their effects pedals into the Kemper Profile and the Kemper Profiler right to the right to the soundboard and it sounds amazing. So there you go. Um, all right, a um, couple of questions now. If you guys have questions, uh, let me know. Um, Sausa, Sausalito Kid is saying, I have a 68 Princeton with built-in reverb and trebolo. Uh, fantastic, that's a great amp. Um, how do I work those in? Well, tremolo, which we haven't even talked about, is is the wah 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 wah. It's it's a uh, um, um, a volume really, a quick volume effect, and um, uh, generally on the tremolo, that's a trickier thing to use because it's such a specialized effect. I imagine you probably would have a foot pedal that goes along with it. You can turn it on and off, but the reverb. Uh, I believe was the other thing that you said you had on that pedal. Um, the reverb, here's the deal with reverb on an amp, which I love. Generally reverbs on an amp, you're dealing with a spring reverb. Someone was asking me earlier about spring reverbs. Spring reverbs is literally a spring in the back of your amp that they shoot the sound through and uh, they, it gets it gets kind of a, a very um, uh, uh, um, noticeable type sound. The more you add of it, the more echoey it sounds, the more the larger of a room you sound like you're in. Um, and that's a spring reverb. If you bounce your amp a little bit too much, that spring will hit the side of that metal container and you'll notice you'll get this big crash on that doesn't hurt anything, but it just sounds terrible. Um, spring reverbs are great. That's the kind of reverb that you generally have in an amp, is a spring, re spring reverb, especially in those fenders. Um, like that, great amp. Now, you don't want to put too much reverb, but generally I like to keep reverb on an amp around three. Uh, maybe between three and four, just enough to where you kind of hear it as much. But reverb is kind of like, um, uh, you know, sauce. If you if you if you put too much, and you can actually hear it, then that ruins it. You need to you need to have it where you notice it, and then back it off about ten percent, um, and that's the right place to have it. Okay, but reverb's great. Uh, reverb takes your sound from being dry to being open. Let me take off the delay bar of that. Okay. It just adds a little bit of warmth to your sound, which is really great. You kidding? I was in the studio just a couple of days ago, and the, and the vocalist was saying, "Give me some reverb. Let me let me feel the room a little bit." So it's a great uh, effect to have either on your board or on your amp. Now my amp back there is my little Polytone Jazz amp, um, I, which I use for a lot of things, but I use all kinds of different amps too. Um, and that has a spring reverb in it too, but I generally don't use that because I, I like having more control over it by using these. Um, Shemar, Shemars is saying, what's the price range of a pedal board? Well, well kids, here's how that goes. You can buy pedals that cost 90 bucks or 50 bucks or 100 bucks, and you can buy pedals that cost 500 bucks and 800 bucks. And you can have a pedal board that costs five grand, or like this pedal, like this is probably about 150, that's probably about 150, this is probably about 70 or 80, that's probably about 70, this is probably about 60, that you can't find anymore, I think I paid about 70 for that when I got it off of a, at a used place. Um, this is probably about 100-ish. Uh, so I mean, there's probably about a grand on this pedal board right here. Um, but these are the sounds that I use. This is what I make my living. This is how I pay my mortgage is off of these sounds. So um, um, it is an investment. Now, I, there are guys walking around with boards that have $5,000 worth of gear on them. And uh, it just depends on what you want to do. It is not a direct comparison of how much you spend, how good your sound is. It does not work that way. Uh, let me say that as, as, as obvious as I can. Do not overspend on pedals. Now, if you find a pedal that you love and you find the right one, you fall in love with it, great, get it, pay for it. But 
don't kill yourself to try and find a clon and pay 800, 900 bucks for a clon when you're still going to sound like you. It's just going to have a different, a different sound. So realize that most of it is in your hands. Okay. I had, had a, a very wise person tell me one time, it's not the arrow, it's the Indian. That's very true when, when talking about pedals. Telaru is saying, are the inexpensive cheap China pedals worth it? Well, there are some Chinese knockoff pedals that are junk, okay? But there are also some Chinese knockoff pedals that are actually getting better and better. So do your research, do your, read your reviews on it. Do it, you know, you, you can't even get the internet these days. You can research anything and just find the one with a lot of reviews on it that are, that are positive and you'll figure out the pedals that are good pedals. Boss pedals are always, you can't go wrong with boss pedals. Um, um, I, I do a lot of stuff with True Tone because I know the folks over there. Um, so I enjoy those. TC Electronic pedals, brilliant pedals, great pedals. Um, but there are Strymons. Strymons are, gosh, brilliant pedals. A little more pricey, but just brilliant pedals as well. So um, there you go. Oh, um, um, let me mention, uh, Steve is, Steven is asking, does the order of the pedals play a big role in the end result? The short answer is yes. There's a very, uh, um, it's, it's not set in cement, but there's a general order of how things should flow. Your flow, for me, I like to have my compressor first. Some guys have compressors at the end uh, to compress the sound after you've affected it all. I like to have it first to, to make sure my sound is controlled. Then you put distortion-y kind of stuff first. Then you have modulation-y stuff. Then you have delays and reverbs, and then you send it out. Okay, so kind of the three main food groups distortion, gains, overdrives. The next in your signal chain is choruses and flanges and, 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 and things that are manipulating the signal, pogs and, and uh, pitch generators and things like that. Over here we have delays and reverbs. That's kind of the last at the end of your signal chain. Even the order of the distortions has the, the one that is the last is going to have the most color of your sound. So it, yes, if I've put these in different order, then yes, they would very much sound very differently and react very differently. It's a system. So play around with it. If you like one way, try it around and see if, see if you like it a different way. And you go, oh, okay, I, I kind of like that a little bit better. Great. So as, yes, the order of the pedals is uh, very uh, important. Ryan is saying, what's the best way to combine a chorus pedal with a reverb? Put the chorus first and then the reverb would be the best way to combine them. Uh, Shamar is asking, is there a synth pedal? Yes, there is. I saw one on Boss uh, today. I'm not quite sure what all it does, but I'm sure it adds just all the, you know, play the note and it goes all that sort of stuff at the end. Uh, go, you can go to Pog and uh, uh, a Pog pedal and that'll, ch it's kind of those synth pedals as well. Um, Joel, why would you ever stack overdrive pedals? Hey man, that's one of the most fun things to do with overdrive pedals. So if I've got my four, or actually there's three different distortions because I'm using that as a clean. But I've got my Marshall sort of sound, I've got my regular lead sound, then I've got a warm sound over here. But if I combine these two, then I kind of use that for a lead when I use them both. If I want a warm lead, maybe I'll put these two on. I've had them all three on. So you see how I can get three different pedals or three different distortions and get nine or more sounds out of them by just combining them and stacking them. Okay, it's a very... Uh, important way to to get different sounds. Don't believe me? So this gets really super warm. So stacking them, you can get other colors as well. Um, Dale is this saying, where would I put a Boss synthesizer pedal? I put mine at the end of my chain before my loop station and the clean boost. Um, the loops would be generally after everything as well, so that would be fine. And the clean boost, I generally put mine at the end too, so it sounds like you have, the, have them right where you want them to be. Joel is saying, where does the EQ go? Well, it depends on what you're trying to EQ. If you're trying to just EQ generally your, your sound of your guitar, then you put it earlier on. 
if you're wanting to EQ kind of the overall affected sound of your guitar, then you put it later. EQs can come either anywhere in the spectrum. Um, John is saying, what are my thoughts on an EQ pedal? I think they're great. If you want to get a little more punch out of your sound, generally you can either get that through the amp, you by tweaking you know, up the bass or up the treble on the amp or lowering the mids or something like that, or, or you can do it on an EQ pedal. Some guys prefer an EQ pedal. Uh, they're great. I have nothing, nothing bad to say about those as well. Um, um, Mark Delaware is asking about acoustic pedals. I do have an acoustic pedal board, which um, is around here somewhere. Uh, uh, Paula, can you give me that board right there? It's in that black bag, right? Nope, 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 uh, further over there. Yep, that little black bag there, hand that to me. Okay, this is my acoustic rig, thank you. This is my acoustic rig, uh, and again, all of, the, all of the, the links for all this is in the YouTube description as well. This is what I use when I'm doing acoustic and I'm doing live stuff. So I use the Pedal Train Nano board. Now it's not, this is not plugged in right at the moment, as you can tell. This is my acoustic rig. Okay, I've got my one spot. Hey, here's a one spot. You can see see what they look like. Um, I've got my Fishman Aura Spectrum. This is, uh, allows me to do an EQ on my sound, as well as I can add, um, it's almost kind of a modeling thing with, uh, uh, I can make my guitar, which run through a system coming through the, the piezo pickup naturally sounds kind of brittle. This warms it up by and making it sound a little bit more like it's a mic'd gu guitar. So it's a, this is a great unit, great unit. This is a Fishman Aura Spectrum. Um, if I'm playing my J45, I dial up a J45. If I'm playing a, a uh, uh, my McPherson, I dial up a McPherson. If I'm playing my nylon string, I dial up a nylon string sound up here. And you can do, get different presets and things like that. Um, after that, or in the effects loop of this, I have my, uh, this is the flashback delay, just a little bit of a delay if I want that. There's a little bit of reverb if I want that. These are all TC Electronic mini pedals. And then there is the uh, uh, looper, uh, little, little ditto looper if I want that. And then it's all on a little pedal train nano board that I put in that little soft case, and that's my acoustic rig. So I've played huge things with both of these boards. And, and different guys have different gear that's, that speaks to them and works for them. This is what works for me. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my stuff. So do you need a board for your acoustic? Yes, at least some sort of a processor with it that you can use to um, uh, uh, tweak your sound. Because generally, the sound coming out of a regular a, a, uh, um, under saddle pickup is going to sound very brittle. And it's going to sound not very good. So uh, you almost always, 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 unless you have a really great sound guy, you're, I'm going to need some sort of a processing in my, in my pedal. Now we've also used, this also functions as a DI pedal, that Fishman or a Spectrum, so it'll send a line directly out to the um, um, sound board. Robert is saying, can I talk about the cables between the pedals? You bet, Robert. This is my cable. This is, let me do this. This is a George L's cables, okay? George L's, again, the links are in the, in the uh, description down there. I've been in Nashville probably, well, almost 20 years in Nashville and probably 15 or 16 years, actually more than that, it's probably about 17 or 18 years, I have used these pedals or these cables. Not cables like this, I've used these cables for 17 years almost every day. They've been run over amps, they've been overseas, they've been in arenas, they have played all kinds of things. I made this cable myself from George L's stuff. Now, is it the best cable that money can buy? Well, I don't know. Does it really matter? I'm a, I'm a professional guitarist in Nashville, and I'm saying to you, does it really matter? Um, yes, you can spend 150 bucks on a 10-foot monster cable that has been cryogenically frozen and, and stuff from NASA has been plated, whatever, and the gold whatever whatevers, okay? I've just lost my endorsement for those expensive cables. Now, uh, it really, I guess if you put it on an oscilloscope, maybe you might hear, you might see a little bit of a difference. 
again, 99.9% .9 of your sound is here. The little that I've used cables like this for almost 20 years. Have your cables lasted 20 years? They're not that, they're not really, sonically they're fantastic, but durability, they, they're about the same as just an, an average pedal or average cable. If you're interested, the links are down below. I can't recommend them highly enough. They're great. They're, they're a family owned company. I know them and they're great. And uh, they're the only ones I've ever had gone bad was my own, my own stupidity. I left it in when we were doing a fly date and um, left it plugged into my pedal board and it got a little uh, bent and that was the only thing that has ever gone wrong with my George L's cables. So the cables between my effects over here are the George L's effects cables that come in there, uh, effects cable patch bay. So those are those as well. Um, so Neil is saying, are expensive cables worth it? In my opinion, not as much as you would think. Uh, Rich is saying, how does a fuzz pedal fit in? Well, fuzz is in the distortion range, and that's on the way distortion metal area. Not warm, not overdrive. That's on the way end of the spectrum over here. So uh, it's a great, unique set of, uh, little pedal um, if you're looking for exactly that sound. But for general stuff, it's going to be too harsh. Um, do electric pedal boards cost more than acoustic? Well, it depends on what you have on your board. Mine does because it just has more, more, um, more um, giz gizmos and gadgets on it. So anyway, that's enough of all of that stuff. It's time to land this ship. Um, if you like what we do, tonight we were kind of just all over the place, but I just kind of want to give you a, a introduction into cables and gear. If you have questions on it, just type them in the, in the YouTube description, or in once we get this video up, type them in the YouTube uh, questions, and I'll try and answer as many of them as I can. Again, all of this stuff, the links are in the description below that you can get some more uh, information about any of these pedals there. Um, all right. Let me mention the Guitar Gathering 2020 conference. I've been holding off on saying because one wasn't sure if, how things were going to land with it. Well, it has officially landed. We have shifted dates for our, our Guitar Gathering conference. The, it used to be in June, June 10th through the 13th. That we are not allowed into our host university at that time because of the virus and all. But uh, they are opening things back up for later in July. So we've, we've moved it back about six or seven weeks to the very last few days in July. So July 29th through August 1st is now our Guitar Gathering Conference. So if you're interested, hey, I just got confirmed again today. Robin Ford is going to be with us for our conference. Um, uh, Joe Robinson, Australia Idols, Australia's Got Talent winner, okay? He's going to be with us. Parker Hastings, Thumb Picker of the Year, He's going to be with us. David Greer, flat picking guitarist of the year. He is going to be with us. So we have covered a whole lot of ground there. All kinds of workshops of on uh, various um, types of guitar playing, bluegrass and jazz and things like that. If you're interested, we are back on for the Guitar Gathering Conference later in July, a full well over two months from now. So uh, think how much in the world has changed in the last two months. Hopefully, 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 Things will have dissipated um, um, and almost hopefully they'll be gone. If the trajectory is right, we should be pretty much done with everything by the end of July. So uh, we are back on for our Guitar Gathering Conference. So if you're interested, please, please, please sign up. It's going to be a, a great, great time. We're going to be social distancing and, and all of that sort of stuff to keep everybody safe and healthy. That's our first goal. But I'm just thrilled that we are able to be back on again. So um, there you go. Um, um, we also have our fall finger style retreat. Let me not forget that in uh, at the end of October and August with Antoine DeFore and Clive Carroll, just two amazing things. If you amazing players, if you're interested in, in uh, the fall retreat, look underneath fingerstyleretreat.com. If you're interested in the guitar gathering, um, just the best guitar conference in Nashville. Um, we won the Acoustic Guitar Magazine's Player's Choice Award for best best guitar camp a few years back. You can go to guitargathering2020.com. Hey, before we go, um, thank you all for being a part. Don't forget to, uh, um, you know, click on the PayPal link and help us support this or do the super chat there. I appreciate you guys so much helping to support the work that we do here. 
And uh, we will be back on tomorrow for our bar, our final bar cord workout. And then we will be uh, uh, done with bar cords. And I know it's just thousands of people have watched those already. So it is a thrill to be able to uh, offer those. Um, if you're interested, we also have the PayPal link then there too, which helps donate. Let me just play something as we're as we're getting away to everything. Let me just kind of play out with something. Let me add a little bit of warmth here. Okay, and let me just close this out with a, a little a little noodling around here. Have a good week, everybody. Hey, we will see you guys next time.